Welcome to another installment of Donning the Armor. This morning we will begin in Numbers chapter 24, verse 1. Now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as at other times to seek to use sorcery, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. So, Balak wants him to continue trying to curse, continue to constantly go out and do different things. We're going to go to this place. We're going to go to that place. Well, now they come to the newest place. And Balaam, seeing that it's pleasing the Lord to bless Israel, that the Lord's taken enjoyment in this, he's not going to go up and he's not going to seek to use sorcery. He's not going to set up these altars and do all this stuff. He's not going to do what he was once doing. But now he's just going to set his face to the wilderness. He's going to look over the encampment. And he's just going to let the Spirit of God come upon him the way he should have been doing the whole time. Then he took up his oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Baor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. So now you have Balaam. And this is what he's saying, the Spirit of God coming upon him, that he's saying, this is my utterance as Balaam, the son of Baor. This is what I'm speaking as a man who has now had his eyes opened, as one who hears the words of God, who sees visions of the Almighty, How lovely are your tents, O Jacob. How lovely are your tents, your dwellings, O Israel. Like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars besides the, beside the waters. How beautiful are you, stretched out. You know, there's always the thought speaking that, especially by Christians, obviously, that more than a Jewish writers would say, that this can't mean, kind of stretched out as a cross in that kind of formation. No real evidence of that. Beautiful sight if it was. But either way, he's looking out at the, tw the tents, this giant city of people stretched out in the wilderness, tabernacle in the middle, seeing them go about their lives, seeing them worshiping the Lord, and how beautiful and how wonderful and how lovely they are. Stretched out like gardens, like pl aloe plants, like cedars lining the waters. Set up as just this beautiful sight. He shall pour water from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. So he pours out, his seed shall be in many waters. He will spread out amongst the lands. His king shall be higher than Agag. Not just his king as in Jesus, but his king as in David and Solomon. That the greatest king they could imagine, the king that comes out of this will be greater than all. The kingdom will be exalted. It was in the days of David. It was in the days of Solomon. And it would be again, or will be again, in the days of Jesus. God brings him out of Egypt. He is strength like a wild ox. Once again, like a rhinoceros. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them with his arrows. His, he bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? He's going to consume everything in his path. Any enemy that comes before him will be destroyed because God will go before him as a wild ox with the strength of a rhinoceros. He lies down as a lion. And who arouses a lion? Who would be dumb enough to go over and see a peaceful lion sleeping and decide, I want to pull on its tail. I want to irritate this giant death machine 
because that's all cats are. Ridiculous death machines. I love cats, by the way. Blessed is he who blesses you and cursed is he who curses you. That is not a prophecy that has gone away. I spoke about that and ranted about that at the little bit at the end of the last episode. Blessed is he who blesses Israel. Cursed is he who curses Israel. Then Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam, and he struck his hands together, and Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Now, therefore, flee to your place. I said I would greatly honor you, but in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor. The words of the serpent itself. The words of abundant, abundant evil. Balak angered because of his pride, angered because he's a king and somebody is not doing what he said. Therefore, flee to your place. I said I would greatly honor you, but in fact, the the Lord, the Lord God has kept you from being honored. The Lord has kept you from being honored. Eve, don't you want to be like God? That tree of good, the knowledge of good and evil? God's keeping you back from that. He's keeping you back from being like him. Don't you want to eat of it anyway? To be like him? God has kept you back from your honor. You know, it's something we will fall into so many times. Living in this fallen, sinful world where we will hear people say, look at all that you're giving up. Look at all that you're sacrificing. Look at all this sin we're having fun in. That brings us some temporary happiness. Look at what your God is keeping you from. Oh, you want to give money away to the poor. You want to tithe the churches. You want to give the missionaries. You could have kept that money and look at what you could have had if you had just saved it and earned it or invested it. The Lord's kept you back from being wealthy. Your adherence to this magical sky daddy has kept you from being what you could have been if you had followed me in the world. That is the voice of Satan himself. There is no honor we are ever kept from because of the Lord. We are honored to even be allowed in the presence of the Lord. Because there is no greater honor than that. There is no greater honor than being in God. You know what? Look at athletes. You'll see these athletes, these Christians. These people are the best in the world at what they do. And what do they turn around and say? Any chance I have to honor God, there is nothing greater. If I honor him, by speaking his name while I play this sport, there is no greater honor than to speak his name and praise his name. Not to get to play the sport, but to praise his name while doing it. God will never keep us back from honor. All honor comes from being in the Lord. Don't let the world fool you and pull you away by promising you some great honor that will burn away, that will tarnish and fade because the honor the Lord has for us is eternal. That is what we need to honor. That is what we need to keep our eyes on. People will say that, oh, we, we're... we're we almost have a slave mentality that we just sit back and say, oh, the blessings we have in the Lord, we can't complain because of how much we have, even if we have nothing and there are people doing wickedness, having so much more than us. It's because as a Christian, speaking for myself mainly, I don't measure success the way the world would measure success. To me, success is involving myself with this program every week because it keeps me in scripture. 
It keeps me learning about the Lord. It keeps me feeling closer to the Lord. Because honestly, there is no time I feel closer to the Lord than I do right now recording these when I am praying or when I'm hugging my children. I feel closer to the Lord then than I do when I'm in church. Because as much as I love being in church, especially my midweek service, as much as I love being in church, there's something special about being alone with the Lord. And there's no honor that could ever be greater. There's nothing the world could give me that could replace that. And I know because I didn't come to Christ until I was like 39 years old. I've been on the other side for a long time. I know what the world has. And it's not worth it. There's nothing special about it. What I have now is worth so, so, so much more. So much more. So Balaam said to Balak, Did I not also speak to your messengers whom you sent to me, saying, If Balak were to give me this house full of silver and gold, I would not go, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do bad, do good or bad of my own will. What the Lord says that I must speak. And now indeed, I am going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. So he's continuing to speak. He said, look, I told you all of this, but now I got more for you. So he took up his oracle and said, the utterance of Balaam, the son of Baor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are open, and the utterance of him who hears words of God and has knowledge of the Most High, he who sees visions of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel, and batter the brow of Moab, and destroy all the sons of Tolman. And Edom shall be a possession. Ser also, his enemies shall be a possession, while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob, one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. Then he looked on Amalek and he took up his oracle and said, Amalek was first among the nations, but shall be last until he perishes. Then he looked at the Kenites and he took up his oracle and said, Firm is your dwelling place and your nest is set in the rock. Nevertheless, Cain shall be burned. How long until Asher carries you away captive? Then he took up his oracle and said, Alas, who shall live when God does this? But ships shall come from the coasts of Cyprus, and they shall afflict Asher and afflict Eber, and so shall Amalek until he perishes. And so Balaam rose and departed and returned to his place. Balak also went his way. In the end of days, in the end of times, one will arise in Israel from Jacob who will have the scepter, that scepter of power, Jesus ruling it with a rod of iron. And none, none will stand against him. He turned to the princes of Moab and referred to each of them and said, not one of you will stand against Israel when the time comes. Not one of you will stand against what the Lord is bringing forth. You think you have power now, but you have nothing compared to what he is bringing forth. Same thing when Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar his dream of the statue with the gold and the silver and the bronze. But then a rock comes out and destroys them all. You may be powerful now, but you will not be powerful forever. And in the end, none of the empires will matter because there will come a kingdom that is eternal 
and will put to destruction all things and will rule over all things. Now moving on to chapter 25. We do see that there was a plan set forth. And we will learn, I believe in Deuteronomy, that this was set forth by Balaam before he departed. See, he couldn't curse the children of Israel. He could not get them to fall. He could not get God to curse them, only bless them in abundance. But Balaam was a man who sought after his own wickedness. And he wanted some of that honor and riches from Balak and the, the princes of Moab. So he said, I can't do these things, but I have a plan for how you can get them to curse themselves in the eyes of God. And this is that plan. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So the Israel joined, so Israel joined to Baal of Peor and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. So they couldn't lose their blessing. Not spiritually, but they could fall to the lusts of their flesh. We saw that once before when they angered the Lord over not having meat and he gave them over to the lusts of their flesh. Kebrath of Atah, the graves of lust. Well, here we get it again. They give themselves over to the sexual lusts for the women of Moab, women they were told to stay away from. And because they now commit this, uh, this harlotry with the women of Moab, they start to sacrifice to the gods of Moab, these false idols. They now eat and bow down to these gods. Because remember, they're now living in this portion of the land where they drove these people out. Now they're on the border of Moab. And while they can't overpower them with an army, they can't get God to curse them. And there are no other gods to curse them because they're false gods. They can corrupt Israel by their flesh, though. Corrupt them by their lustful appetites. And that's what they get them to do. They get them to turn, they get them to turn themselves from the blessings of God. Then the Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So he told Moses, get the leaders of your people. You're going to gather these people up and you're going to hang them out in the sun. You're going to kill them and you're going to hang them. These people who turned against me to play the harlot with these women who they weren't supposed to be near and with these false gods that they were not supposed to touch. And you got to wonder if God's anger wasn't aroused even more because of the blessings that were just, were just put out on their, on their behalf in front of these princes and kings. But then they fall away from God themselves. They turn to chose, or they chose to turn, I should say, their back on the Lord. This Lord who just said to others, I witnessed no iniquity in Jacob. I saw no wickedness in Israel. But then because of their lusts, they turn, they move, and they commit these horrific acts away from God. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. So these generals, basically, I imagine this is where you're speaking of Nashon and those people. Nashon's the only one that remember his name that you're now to go and kill the people of your own tribe. Go through and kill anyone who has turned and has joined themselves to this false God. 
eradicate them, period. Hang them out as an example. Because we are now facing a crisis. The Lord is bringing us to the promised land. And once again, we are turning from it. We are falling away. We are falling away because you can't control your lusts. You lust after sin. You lust after sin to such a point that you would put everyone, your eternity on the line to follow your lust. That through all the blessings, through all the atonement, through everything you have been provided for, you can't turn away from your lust. We are told in scripture that the heart is desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? As Paul would say in Romans, I do what I don't want to do and don't do what I want to do. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? All of the victory they just had, all of the provision, all of the blessings. Why, why, why would you follow after your lusts in such a way? Why? Who can know? But they decided chasing lust, chasing sin would be the right decision in this place. When you take your eyes off God, you fall into the ocean. Because there is sin all around just waiting to drown us. Give in to lust and you fall. I think I've said it before, but a thought becomes an action. An action becomes a habit. A habit becomes a way of life. And a way of life becomes what you are destined to go on to. I don't know who said it first. I heard my pastor say it first. And it's just the truth. They see these women. They begin to have that lust, which the law said you commit adultery. You're breaking the sin. You're breaking the commandments. You're sinning. Jesus said even lusting after a woman, just that thought means you're sinning and you need to repent and turn from it. These people let that sin, that thought, become an action. And when we allow our thoughts to become an action, that sinful thought to become an action, we've already started down a path that will not lead to something good. And indeed, all the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his, in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. The man of Israel and the woman threw her body, so the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. So they come. They're trying to stop it. But there's a man in this tent who doesn't want to turn away. He wants to continue following his lusts. And Phinehas, the son of the high priest now, a priest himself, who will, who will be a priest himself, if he isn't already, takes a javelin, takes a short spear, and pins them both to the ground. He has had enough. This is ending on his watch. He is taking that zealousness for the Lord and putting an end to what was plaguing them. So now as this is happening, this plague is spreading again. 24,000 people died in the plague. You know, we'll read elsewhere in scripture. It says 24, 23,000, I believe, died in one day. Say, well, how is it 23 when it says 24? Well, it just means that 
24, 23 died in the first day, and another thousand would end up dying in the plague thereafter. Plague was sent out because of the anger of the Lord, once again, because they turned from him, because they were so wicked that they followed the lusts of their flesh. And it was for this man, this Phineas, to put a stop to it, to stand in the gap the way Aaron had with the censer. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. That because he was so zealous for me, he was zealous and righteously angry as I was angered, that he felt my anger in a way and did what I wished him to do. Therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. And it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. Now the name of the Israelite who was killed, who was killed with the Midianite woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, the leader of a father's house among the, uh, the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby the daughter of Zer, who was head of the people of a father's house in Midian. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Harass the Midianites and attack them, for they harassed you with their schemes by which they seduced you in the manner of Peor, in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the leader of Midian, their sister who was killed in the day of the plague because of Peor. So God is telling Moses, you are now going to bring death upon them the way they brought death upon you. Vengeance will be had now. They harassed you with schemes, got you to be turned from me because they couldn't get me to curse you. They attacked your weak, wicked heart and turned you from me. And because of the zeal of Phineas, you were saved because of the zeal of one man you were saved and my anger was turned from you he made atonement for you the zeal of one man so often we get caught up in the idea that i'm only one person what can i truly do for the faith what can i truly do for the lord what can i truly do for this church what can I truly do for the faith? What can I truly do for Jesus? I said faith twice for a reason. But it doesn't matter if we're one person. Because it's who we have faith in that works through us. When we are zealous for the Lord, we do things we do would not have known we could do or would do or were capable of doing. We do things that we're uncomfortable doing. We do things that are unexpected of us. We do things that we wouldn't have believed possible because of our zeal for him. And because of that zeal, because of that faith, he works through us in great and mighty ways. You know, it's said, they did studies on it, that no matter the size of a church, when a church split happens, it happens because of seven or less people. You have a church of 50 people, you have a church of 10,000 or 20,000 people. The schism in the church happens because of seven or less people. That's how much damage wickedness can do among the brethren. When a revival strikes out, oftentimes it's because of a small group of people. You look at all of the things that happened through the power of the Lord with Billy Graham, one man, 
Sure, he had a team. One man the Lord used as a figurehead. You look at, I believe it was the Welsh Revival in Wales, started with a couple college students, just a handful of college kids, ended up taking entire towns by storm to the point where they shut down bars, not because of any laws, but because no one wanted to drink because they thought it was against their, their overzealousness in the Lord. You look at the Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s. A couple of hippies. One man can make such a difference. You can do so much more than you think because it's not for you to do. It's for you to be used as a tool of the Lord. If the Lord is calling you to something, it doesn't matter how big it seems. Because if the Lord is the one truly calling you to it, he's going to work through you in ways you couldn't imagine. That's just his power. That's his sovereignty. That's his love for his people. And the amazing blessings he pours out on us. Be zealous for the Lord and ready to be used. The parable of the bridesmaids. You had half of them ready with oil, half of them not. Be ready. Be ready at all times to be used in the service of the Lord. There are so many people we don't learn enough about in Scripture. Phineas is one of them. A man who saved his people from a plague brought about for them desiring and chasing sin because he was overzealous for the Lord and his zeal matched the zeal of the Lord and he did as he had to do as the Lord empowered him to do to bring about an end to the plague because his love for the Lord outweighed everything else in his life. And that's the way we should be. Our love for the Lord should be greatest above all else. Be zealous for Jesus, for God, for your relationship with him. And be zealous. Be that man who stands up. Be that person who when the Lord says, as he said to Isaiah, said in Isaiah, who shall we send? And Isaiah said, send me, Lord. Send me, I am ready. I'm unclean, I'm unworthy, but send me because I am zealous for you. Be zealous for God. Be his tool and be used in great and mighty ways for his work. That's where we will end it for this morning. I hope this was fruitful for you. I hope to see you back again next time. But until then, be blessed.